If there is a favorite to finish in the top two, it would be 27-year-old Josh Davis, triple gold medalist from the 96 Olympics, most golds rowdy by any American man at those games. You know, I have seen Josh Davis take a lot of races out very fast, but I've never seen Josh take it out that fast. And he's still ahead of world record pace of the half. Davis looks like he's going to win it, and Davis sets an American record. He breaks a 12-year-old mark. What a swim for Davis. Welcome to the Ultimate Swimmer Podcast. I'm your host, three-time Olympic gold medalist and captain of the 2000 USA team, Josh Davis. Here at Ultimate Swimmer, we hope to inform, inspire, and encourage you to be the very best version of you, physically, mentally, and spiritually, on your swimming journey. This podcast is geared primarily for those of us in the aquatic disciplines of age group swimming, college swimming, para swimming, open water swimming, and master swimming. But we welcome all who are interested in peak performance, pursuing excellence, and swimming with purpose. So whether you are just starting out in the pool or you've been swimming your entire life, you were born for the water and you were also born for greatness. So each week we will explore the seven core habits of achieving greatness that will help take you to the next level in your journey to becoming an ultimate swimmer. This episode is brought to you by Breakout Swim Clinics, the longest running swim clinic tour of swimming Olympians in U.S. history. Breakout Swim Clinics has been providing swim clubs with the biggest Olympic names for the best prices with gold medal service since 1997. Go to BreakoutSwimClinic.com and bring some of their great Olympians to your team to help your swimmers break out. Bigger names, better prices, gold medal service. Break out with the best. BreakoutSwimClinic.com Hey everybody, welcome to an old, another Ultimate Swimmer podcast show. I'm your host, Josh Davis, and I couldn't be more excited to have this guest. We're just about celebrating our year anniversary of this Ultimate Swimmer podcast, and we've kind of saved the best for the year anniversary. And this guy is a 10-time world record holder. He's a seven-time Olympic medalist, seven-time Olympic medalist, five gold of seven, three over three Olympiads, a multi-time national champion for the University of Texas, and most importantly, one of the best training partners I ever had, and a dear friend. Please welcome to the show, Aaron Pearsall. Way to go. <laughs> Good to be on the show, Josh. Right? It Great to be on the show, not to mention uh, frequent travel buddy around the entire country. Yes, I was going to title. Time. I was going to title today's show Adventures with Aaron, because <laughs> you and I have some adventures together, but you have a lot of adventures around the world. And we'll talk about that. Um, but uh, so I'm glad that the swimmers get to know you a little bit more. And uh, yeah you know, share some of the great, great moments we've had together that you've had at the Olympics. Um, well, it's, so real I love that you're doing this. You're a great ambassador for, for bringing people on the show and continuing the whole thing on. I think it's a great role for you, Josh. Perfect. Look at you well, on the internet <laughs> doing the webinar. It's I've, great. Yeah. I've, I've been blessed to be around a long time. So you get to know a lot of people and, I think I think our generation of the times we were together from 1999 to 2010 was a really special time in swimming. Um, obviously, we were contemporaries with Michael Phelps, and but you, Brendan Hansen, Ian Crocker, Phelps, and you know a ton of other females uh, that did great work. You know, we just it was a, it was a special decade for USA swimming. So I'm excited to talk about it. It is, it was and it's yeah it's neat staying in touch with everyone from that time and you know yeah still doing what we're doing it's great yeah well you and I first met I guess in '99 at Pan Pax is that right did you go to Pan Pax at the Sydney Pool that kind of the dress rehearsal no I didn't go to Pan Pax with you um, we would have met in. I guess it was, but it may have been before that it may have been like a nationals before that or something like that. And, yeah. um, um, but right around there, I think maybe 98, yeah. 99. So over 20 yeah. years we go back and, and you were like the patriarch of the team ready, you know, and like, like our little like daddy 
We're back. Three That's right. Around. 20 years ago, I was the granddad of the team. So, geez, what does that make me now? <laughs> I don't know. You're still the granddad of the team, yeah. Yeah. As far as we're concerned. Well, anyway, I remember we made the team together in Sydney. You're one of the Fab Four, Fab Five teenagers. Michael Phelps was 16. You were 17. Crocker was 18. Eric Vent and Cleet was 19. Um, so, yeah, it was a fun group. We were in the middle distance right. group together. We got to do some sets together with young Michael Phelps and, and the middle distance group. Schubert was our coach a lot. Um, I remember you doing it at a training camp. You're doing a set with Dave Salo and just killing it. I don't know if it was like 2075s at race pace. And I was like, holy cow, this this guy can train. He doesn't mind the yeah. rough stuff. Well, when you're 17 years old, you know, right? It's nice. Yeah, it's a good <laughs> thing. Dude. You could go forever. Um, but that was, yes, that was a lot of fun. And you were a team captain on that trip. I'm pretty sure, right? You were our captain. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that was that was special. My first big captain. I was ninety eight, captain ninety eight, ninety nine, but two thousand was my first Olympics. Me and Tom Wilkins were co captains for the dudes, and uh, yeah, that was it was a very successful team for the guys and girls. And we were going into the Lions Den trying to make sure Australia doesn't upend us as the number one nation. I think I think that was the last time that our country has been challenged in yes. swimming like that right and and like i i look back on that and i think about um speak about the men's side and i i think about the and the women's side i guess for that matter but um i still look at the the the, the people that swam for australia at that time and just think wow they were so good because they were and we i remember going home that night that first night and just thinking not home but back to the village after having a less than stellar opening that first night we had lost mm -hmm. a relay and uh and we were all down and, and all that it was just you know it was a really fascinating kind of thing that that team usa probably for better or worse i don't know really isn't used to being like having to climb themselves out of the hole in international meet so I, I actually am really grateful that we super grateful we got challenged i wish I wish there was, I, I hope that happens again. Yeah, it, it really, it really focused us those last few months leading into September Australia Olympics. Cause you know, we didn't know what was going to happen. We didn't, we didn't have felt yet. We didn't know you yet. You know, we had all these unknowns and we weren't, we weren't 98, 97, 98, 99. We didn't do that that much as a men's team, but 2000, it all, it all came together. And yeah, that opening night, we lost the relay and Thorpe made his debut. But I remember I heard the story that Vent and Dolan were in the shaving down back in the dorm and they were getting all fired up saying, we're going to go one, two in that 400 IM and we're going to claw back. And, and of course you and Lenny do great, go one, two in the two back. And then Anthony Irvin and Gary Hall tie for gold in the 50 and Misty wins the 200 fly. And, and that was it. You know, it was like the USA show. It was. It, it we we called back after that. As a seventeen year old, um, kind of on the upswing of my career, it was a very formative experience, and I was able to be on the team with with people who I was was very good for me to look up to. You being one of them, and some there's some women on that team who were such great friends and mentors for for myself as well, and and. Uh, and to kind of attribute that experience and plus Australia with swimming, you know, like going, it's like, it's like our sport in some sense going home, like they love swimming there. And so we, <laughs> we got to experience that. And not only that, but like Australia's team was really good. So everybody was there and swimmers were on the sides of buses, you know, it was just the whole, like, it, it was, fantastic and so yeah you know it, to know that you're in my experience goes back to that is pretty amazing yeah so, yeah so we, we have to keep yeah. moving along to fit 20 years into uh the next 20 <laughs> minutes but uh yeah yeah so yeah, yeah sure 2001 
uh, you're still grooving along. In 2002, I can't remember which meet it was, but I guess it was Summer Nationals 2002. I was next to you in the tuner back, and you just go out like gangbusters. I think, gosh, I don't know, 56, maybe five, nine, tuner back, and then you not came that, back. Yeah. And, not that fast, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. It was fast, but anyways, yeah. 56 something, and then you came back in 59, and you busted Lenny's world record. That was your first world record. And uh, so I, I was I was privileged to be next to you. I always joke that I put you on the start, the first 15 meters, you know, and if, if I wasn't next to you, you wouldn't have broken it. But I'm just teasing. You You were you were gone. You were gone after the 25 meter mark. And uh, and you <laughs> at the end, you, you broke the record and you grabbed my head. And it's you, you're grabbing my head and that's the picture that was on kid. swing world or something it just cracked me up it was i i it cracked, it was amazing yeah i was so excited i didn't know what was going on at that point i was just like on some other cloud but i was 18 years old and i and 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 i had that in, this incredible confidence that day had a great swim in the morning and had, i knew i was capable of doing that it was just a matter of when. Um, I remember the summer before that, we were in Austin, Texas at Nationals. And I remember having this conversation with Phelps. And Phelps is a year and a half younger than me. And we were like, hey, let's go break the world records in our events. you know. And I'm like, I'm like, oh, this is difficult. And he goes and does it. I actually think he went and did it. <laughs> yeah, he did. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I'll do that. So he went and did it. And I was just off by a little bit. I just had like a less than stellar kind of meet, you know, and, and uh, waited a year. And that year was very good for me. I felt like I had was able to accept what was what that responsibility was going to be. Um, yes, I, I still one of the best swims of my entire life. You know, those swims that just feel so good. They you could keep going. That was one of those. Yeah. Yeah. And that was something that you and I get to share. And I grabbed our grand, our, our team granddaddy's head on after the race, poor celebration. That's like an example of like, tone it down, you know? Yeah. 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 Well, hey, you, that fa you, fantastic. Yeah, I guess I was 29 at the time and you were 18 and, and you're just manhandling me after the race. I'm like, all right, this is cool. Uh, you can do that. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> Ah, it was I'm, I'm, I'm excited with you. I know. Um, so 2003, you come to Austin and two great years in Austin. Uh, your first two years uh, swimming with Eddie and the guys. Um, unfortunately, no team national titles while you were there. That didn't work out quite with the point totals, but you contributed, right. you contributed greatly, winning your backstrokes and helping win some medley relays. Um, can you remember any just epic swims the first those first two years? Anything that stands out to you? Obviously, we, you're your best friend forever with the guys on the team, brotherhood forever. Um, training was great, but what sticks out to you your two years in Texas that were kind of special or cool? Well, on an individual level at NC two A's was uh, I went a guys had been trying to go under one forty, no one had done it yet in the two hundred yard backstroke. And so I, I had a chance to do that my freshman year. That was very exciting. And and I did do that. And I did it at the Austin pool. And so for a while, that was actually the pool record, right? Um, we had some really fantastic relays. Those are always the most fun at NC2 A's, right? This is like the best. I'm staring at a nice sunset right now. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, we can tell. Brady. Yeah, it's in my face, but it's good. <laughs> and then... Um, uh, but I think the the team dynamic, those relays are really tough to beat. Being on relays with guys like Crocker and Chris Camp and Brandon Hansen and those guys are pretty fantastic. And, and uh, you know, it's that collegiate brotherhood. I had an opportunity to go professional before college. And I consciously chose not to because I just felt like it was such an because I had broken that world record when I was like coming out of high school, right? And I, right. So I, and and um, and there there's 
to this professional side of search was really on the upswing, like tremendously so. Yep. And so I had this opportunity and I for I forewent that because I for my development in the sport, I just I just knew inherently that swimming at the university was going to do it. And it's gonna help me mature in the way that I wanted to, because I wanted to be in it for the long haul. So those two years competing for the University of Texas and for NC2As and that kind of thing were I can't give those up. Just tremendous and so challenging. NC2As is one of the most incredible swim meets ever, right? Yeah. And three days of just insane insanity. And uh and I needed that. I needed that for the rest of my career. And and uh and it gave me friends for life. Yeah. What I what I tell people and what I've noticed over the years is there's no better way, no more productive way to spend in between Olympia Olympiads, Olympics, is to just train with a college team. Because it's really hard to train four years by yourself for the next Olympics. But when you're with a college team, time just goes by and the hard work gets put in and you're just kind of trucking along and Right. really really helps keep you on track you know like when even when you pare down as to why like other why the u.s is so dominant consistently internationally the one thing that kind of stands out is our collegiate system mm -hmm. like we have we have this other level of amateur sports quote unquote that we're allowed to develop in and it's organized and it's very competitive and it's where all our best, not I you know, it's where so many of our best swimmers are and coaches and teams. And it's a, a group of guys can go swim with a bunch of guys, just guys, and just like hash it out, you know? Yeah. You know, and, and then, and so there's a, it, it, we have that unique system. It helps us be as good as we are. Right? Yeah. So grateful for that. And I met, and I, and I got to know you there and all, and, and that's where, you know, we, we were training like we were training. I was training with you and I was like, man, this guy will not stop. He's supposed to be old and tired and he wasn't. <laughs> and was well, that, like, oh, this is well that, that's what I said about you because in 2000, basically from 97 to 2001, I could win most everything in practice. You know, there was, there was Nate Deucing who was so good. I mean, he could just rip off some incredible stuff. And, of course, trying to race Ian sometimes was crazy. Yeah. But, you know, for the middle distance sets, the IM sets, I could win stuff. When you came, when you came, it drove me crazy because I couldn't, I couldn't beat you. Uh, and we were always right. There were so many, you know, 2,000-yard, you know, threshold IM back free sets that you know, the cubic and Eddie would make up and they were just burners. You just burn for 40 minutes straight and you and I going at it. I know and, it's enough to drive you into a hole. That was just yeah. it. We, we were, we were so competitive in a way where we could just, it, it, it was that an incredible atmosphere. You know, yeah. we, we, even if you were down, you were pushing yourself and each other. <laughs> so that was very important for me and my development. And, uh, and I got to learn from guys like you, Josh, and it's the importance of going to university for a sport like ours. It, it, it's really difficult to forego that. It's something I would always, always say, like, it's an experience beyond the professional aspect of the sport will come, let it yeah. come if you want to go that route. But, um, if you have a chance to swim in college, it just any sport. It's wonderful. Yeah. yeah, no, it's special. I wanted to take a moment from this fascinating interview to let you know about a new partner for the Ultimate Swimmer podcast, and that is Swimshare. Swimshare is a free workout riding tool. Just Google Swimshare, all one word, Swimshare. And you can put in today's workout in just a few clicks, and it sends and stores all your workouts within seconds. The first workout you'll see on there is one of my favorites from yours truly. Check out Swimshare and take your workouts to the next level. Send, store, and share your swimming masterpieces with Swimshare. 
Um, I'm going to fast forward to 2004, Athens, Greece, to race where it all began thousands of years ago. It was special. Phelps was in the zone. You were in the zone. Um, again, you got to be on the medley relays with the, the threesome of you, Brendan Hansen, Ian Crocker, and whoever else happened to be the anchor. At Texas, it was various guys, like you mentioned, Chris Kemp, but at the international level, it was usually Lee Zach, which is special because you and Lee Zach are from the same team in Irvine. And so you win the Hunter back. That was cool. We knew we were going to win the Medley Relay, which was cool. But I kind of want to just briefly uh, have you just give a little insight to the 200 back because I think most people know the story. You, you win you by the goal by a mile, and it's a beautiful swim. But then all of a sudden you get disqualified. The gold medal has gone. But at, in that moment, in that whatever that was, five minutes, ten minutes, you came to peace with not getting a gold medal and being disqualified because you realized that you were you had enjoyed the journey and that you had executed the best you knew how. And I just find that ten minute window fascinating. How you, you came to peace with the process, no matter what the result was. Me too. I find it fascinating. I it ended up be, this this very um, turbulent forty five minutes of my career became like my favorite moment, personal moment, right? And and I think a lot of that is because of what it forced me to think about, right? It, it like forced me into trying to find some kind of of um, real intrinsic thing to hold on to if something was being as as something was being taken away from me like yeah. potentially the thing i was there for was being taken from me i was i was like well shoot would i do this again if i knew that uh, this is the way it would end up and, and it was right. this really interesting exercise of what are you doing here? And, and it's, you know, you, you think, you know, those answers, and you know, those answers are always kind of trite and, you know, it, because you love what you do or whatever it is. And, and, um, but, it, but to be in the moment and to, to have a goal like that and, and to be right there, like you got it, got it. And then something, the, the Jenga piece comes out and you just saw you see it start to crumble and you're just going like, wait, I, what did I do? I didn't move that piece. I didn't do that. That wasn't me, you know? And, uh, and so it, it created this dynamic and what it, what I always think back on about that and about a lot of these other experiences within the sport that we were in within sport in general is all of these wonderful learning moments, like these yeah. moments that we, that, really it's like we we get to test our metal mm -hmm. right not like our m-e-d-a-l but m-e-d-d-l-e like our character yeah and and it, and it's that's the point of sport it's not if things go wrong but when and how are you going to handle it yeah and and so the the thing it what it became was um you know would i do this again and what am I getting out of this? And it was an unequivocal yes. Like I, I realized in that tumultuous moment as the medal was being taken away that I, I wasn't there for the medal, right? I mean, I, I wanted, to, I think I already kind of knew that, but I was forced to confront with that. And yeah. so to this day, it's my favorite experience. And, but 45 minutes later, it was reinstated. I was reinstated. Yeah. And I, I got to go back and receive the medal on the podium. And there's so many other dynamics. There were the other gentlemen involved. Yep. Marcus Rogan, who got a silver medal, was bumped up to gold. And Marcus, being gracious, was, you know, offering to carry the American flag up for me. And then all gets overturned, right? And then it's like, yeah. I'm back, you know, hey, guys. <laughs> So um, to this day, I, I, I look back on that as this wonderful teaching moment of like, you know, you think, you think there are certain things that are just established and good and going to be um, 
rock solid. And it's a one of those things where if the sport is a good metaphor for anything, well, it's life, right? But it's it's a metaphor for just understanding what's in your control and what's not. And it turns out there's really not much in your control. There's just you just got yeah, you know, most of the stuff flies at its own accord. And uh, and I just watched everyone else freak out while I came to peace with it until I got it back. <laughs> <laughs> it was a trip. It was a trip. And I'm really grateful for that. Yeah, strangely enough. I was disqualified at the Olympic Games. Pretty cool. Yeah. Interesting. It, Who gets to say that? So. Yeah, in your baby, in your best event, the 200 back. It was just snatched, kind of taken yeah. away, and you're going through this tunnel of yeah. – this dark tunnel of self-introspection and gratefully you came out the other side and you, you won on multiple levels. You came to peace yeah. with the purpose of your swimming and you were reinstated and got the gold medal and went away with three gold medals in Athens. So anyway, I just think that that's a cool story. So thanks for shedding a little more insight in, into your journey it, on that. It, it's the summary of why we all are in sport in my mind. It's like summed up in this little nugget of an experience of like of learning about yourself learning why you're doing what you're doing and and uh not getting caught up in the wrong with with the wrong um motivations yeah you know and 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 uh in letting things get in the way that don't serve what's actually happening um keeping the perspective is really important so that's that's like when you and I, so for those of you who are watching, like Josh and I have traveled the country, like speaking with kids and 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 um, and watching you, Josh, you know, like inspire kids is incredible. and and it's like all those experiences that we have, um, it, because they were passed down to us, it's such a a a wonderful kind of responsibility to keep passing those down for the kids who can pass those down for the kids who can pass the, because yeah. those things are, that's why we do it. That's why we're, you know, it's the sports. We love swimming. We love this stuff, but we're also learning about ourselves and we're learning yeah. how to handle ourselves in life. And like when stuff goes awry. Yeah. So that's as an example of when something goes awry, that's high level. Yeah. You know, the game. yeah. So when things are supposed to not go awry, when things are supposed to be, perfect and like no one's supposed to make mistakes you know <laughs> like uh, swimmers or officials or whatever coaches yeah. any of them. so yeah, yeah sometimes stuff hits the fan even on the biggest stage in when the whole world's watching and you gotta you know you gotta draw on something and uh Thank we got to stage. yeah and so i think this is a good lesson for a lot of young swimmers out there listening because this uh it's coronavirus year has really stolen a lot from young people and really challenged them to think about why they do what they do. Is it worth it? You know, if my championship meet gets taken away or I get stuck in quarantine, and that, you know, that happened to my team this year and it was awful. And it really, really challenged people to, to deal with what's, why they do it and what's it all about. And you got to enjoy the journey. because You don't know what's going to happen. It, and it is the journey. That's it. It's not one particular year or one particular swim meet or one particular event, right? It's this aggregate. And there's a lot of different experiences that can happen within that aggregate. You hope there's a lot of experiences. If it all happened perfectly, that'd be boring. It'd be great, yeah. you know? But it's like, you know, I mean, it, it's, you know, it's like we, we, you and I both have wild stories like that. Like I was disqualified at the Olympic Games and people People hear that now and they're like, really? Like you were? And I'm like, it wasn't all like hunky dory. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, like it does this. It will inevitably do this. It's just a matter of how you take it and how you go along with it and whether you let it get to you or not. You know? Yeah. No, I, I think people see your 10 world records and seven medals and uh, yeah. five golds and a, a, a relatively charmed life, but they, it's important to know that you've had many, many valleys and, you know, many trials and many hard things. And so that brings me to the next question. I think it was somewhere in 05, 06, 07, I think you were arm wrestling with somebody and you yes. you torqued your shoulder real good. 
you couldn't, yes. you couldn't kick for two, three months. Do you remember what yes, that was? was arm wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> Some late night antics with some of the Texas guys. And, no, it uh, wasn't even. It wasn't even. It was just a day, it was a thing we were doing one day. So, yeah, yeah. Um, was that was that oh seven or was that oh six? I'm trying to remember what year that was. Uh, right around then. That's yeah, about yeah. right. And um, yes, a gentleman named Dan Rowleader and I on a Sunday. Right. Text my my teammate of mine, um, who is who happens to be much stronger than him. and me me in my terrible competitive nature thinking i can take him on or something like that and i just got uh, i totally got just humbled completely and um <laughs> appropriately so and that 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 ended up being like my my one bad injury was like from arm wrestling of all the things yeah. of all the things but that's with Lezak too. Lezak had a bad arm wrestling injury for years. Yeah. <laughs> don't so arm wrestle. Funny. Don't, yeah, arm don't wrestle. it's it's not worth it. It's not worth it's it. Not worth it, as it turns out. That's like the one injury that I have that I will always have from from my years in swimming. Yeah. That's funny. Yes. Well, I yes. my my arm wrestling story is worse because I arm wrestled my wife and and she she almost beat me and it we came I to a tie. Told you that was going to happen. Yeah. I could have told you that was. Yeah, she's she's tough. So, but um, but I I thought you handled that really well. You had to kick for I don't know what it was thirty days, sixty days. I mean, you had yeah. and you kick you kicked hard, and uh, you did break a world record shortly thereafter. You know, because your legs were a whole new level. Right, and I didn't get terribly out of shape. I I did what I could. I I kicked or I swam with one arm, and it was very frustrating as those injuries are yeah all injuries can be but um right it's we, you have to let them heal and it took six weeks to get better to the point where i could use it and then i had i think two weeks or a week and a half to get ready for my race <laughs> that's it you know wow. that's all i had and and uh um so that arm was nice and fresh not tired <laughs> so i relied on that arm <laughs> everything else was tired i just relied on that arm once i got to that point injuries yeah injuries are something we all face too right being honest about those letting them heal and not trying to be the hero because that might just make them chronic like never yeah. go away so yeah it's, it's it's never worse worth risking permanent damage kind of yeah put it put in the rehab work and you know don't worry about the timetable too, too much Right. Yeah. Be patient. And again, it's not about that one season or that one race or that one meet. It's the big picture, thinking the big picture, thinking about wanting to use your arm the rest of your life. Still want to use this. So I don't want to burn it too hard right now. So yeah. I don't want arm wrestling anymore. <laughs> That's right. No. One of the questions I ask our ultimate swimmer guests is what's their favorite YouTube video of themselves that maybe no one else knows about that's on YouTube that you might know about. My favorite, before you answer that, is there was a moment when Phelps was kind of getting bored with his usual events and he was kind of going out into the backstrokes. And he always had, he, he had a great backstroke and we always knew if he really focused on the backstroke, you know, surely he would be super dangerous. And yeah, I was, yeah, I know. He scared that, me more than that me. one year. That, he, that one year at Penn Pax, he took you on in the 200 back and we thought, oh man, what's going to happen? Phelps is the greatest swimmer of all time. He's super fit. Can he can he up in Pearsall and no way, baby. You you never get bet against the Pearsall. <laughs> and you took you took him down the last 50. And I thought, oh, this is so great. Yeah. Yeah. Shoot, man. Um, Michael was good. He just had so many other events, right? That he yeah. was doing that he, he could have done anything. He could have been in any event he wanted to be in. And um but he did, he did bless me with his presence on more than one occasion at a big meet. And I was grateful for it because he always pushed me. He was just one of those people that he just, he could race, you know, he was always willing to race, you know, and, and, um, which was great for me. <clears throat> and, and we were equal enough in that event. I think we were pretty much equal. And I, I just kind of ended up out touching him 
more often than not by a tenth of a second or two tenths of a second or whatever it was. And uh, half, well, I don't know. So, you know, he got me a couple times too. Wow. <laughs> it's not like I walk, not like you walk away from swimming as my goal, not with a few black eyes or something like yeah. that. It's going to happen. You know? No, it always, you, you both made it very, yeah, very, yeah, very, very, uh, very to be able to swim with with mike and and he was a good backstroker like he just yeah. he just stuck with the other events that's a good one that that's a good thing to ask him actually oh yeah so real quick do you have a favorite youtube race that you can think of a youtube race. of you of you one of your old races there is a video that uh, a friend of ours his name is glenn mills took of me when we were out in California after a nationals one summer and we brought Brandon Hansen and Ian Crocker to this surf break in Newport beach or yep. my hometown. Yep. The wedge. And uh, we body surfed for a, a half a day or whatever it was. And Glenn filmed it and then put it online. And then I was sitting there with Brandon and Ian. I got to show these guys what I grew up around and what you know what i liked about water and how i like water that's moving around and um and that was fun that was fun to share with the community yeah. and, and my friends and that kind of thing and there's some swimming races sure shoot man i have so many good memories in the pool and uh so many good memories watching friends and family my sister was a great swimmer so yep. watching my sister swim throughout the years and traveling with her to some international meets at times and and uh, uh you know yes we're, we're blessed we, i was on the national team for 10 years how long were you on the national team for yeah almost almost that i think it was 91 to 2000 so nine nine years for me yeah so, so. i mean you we, we travel a long ways in that much time you know Oh yeah, yeah. Pretty amazing. Well, it, it, you know, you mentioning that uh, body surfing video, which I've seen, it's so cool. I'm jealous. I always, growing up in the in San Antonio and Austin, Texas, I, you know, I just wasn't that close to a beach to really learn the good body surfing tricks and to find a little little tubes here and there to, to ride. And you make it look easy. So right. we still we still have to do that someday together. But it, it, what it, I would love to. But what it what it shows to me is that you have a special relationship with the water, and you mentioned how you got you got beat at arm wrestling, and and you were good in the weight room. We worked hard in the weight room, but we were never the strongest. And you had a you had a good dolphin kick, and you worked on your dolphin kicks, but it wasn't like it was you know you were like this amazing dolphin kicker, and your you know your 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 backstroke is beautiful, um, but you know it's not like you're super tall, super big guy. You know we're both kind of medium. Yeah. Above average, six two one ninety, but there's something right. you do with your catch, and there's something you do the last fifteen, twenty, twenty five meters of a race that's just really special. And I don't know, maybe you could just talk a little bit about that when you put it all together. Your last fifty is really good. Your your catch is really good. Your your relationship with the water is really good. Your work ethic is really good. Maybe you could just I don't know summarize what set you apart. Sure, best I can. Um, I, I had a very natural stroke, very comfortable backstroke, like very comfortable backstroke, very different than my freestyle, right? And I can compare the two. And I was a decent freestyler, but um, I had a rhythm in backstroke, and that rhythm allowed me to just maintain and sustain, and and I and it it helped me be consistent in I could go a long ways. I was very balanced in the stroke. Um, I didn't overuse my arms or my legs. Everything worked together, and it was a it was simply coordination, I would say. And 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 whenever I teach the stroke, to this day, I I teach it in a way that is very unique. It, it kind of builds the stroke up in a way that I've you know it, it's just not. I've never ever I've never seen it taught otherwise uh, that way yeah. in any other way or any other place else so i think 
um, I had a natural stroke. Um, I, I had very good training to build for my particular race in the 200. I had the ability to kind of do what you did, Josh, which was hold on for a 200. I could kind of sprint, but kind of hold on at the same time. Mm -hmm. You know, I wasn't a drop dead sprinter, but I wasn't a distance guy, but I could like maintain that strong pace. And so I was a, I found my little niche and I, um, I had a, I had a good stroke and I, I knew how to swim my race. And that was actually something that I didn't see very often with people that I would often swim with is I could tell they weren't always very confident in how to swim their race. They might be in very good shape, very physically mm -hmm. fit. Um, but it, it wasn't necessarily married to an understanding of how to swim that particular race on any given day, rain or shine, whatever it was. It was yeah. just kind of, it was kind of divorced from the race. It, and it training need it's kind of this emphasis that training needs to be you know you need to understand how to swim that particular swim no matter what like you on like you can you can do the yardage you can do all the other stuff but it doesn't set you up to know how to pace yourself consistently how to hold on how to how to and and be in that red zone to where it's painful and uncomfortable for an extended period of time consistently yeah. day in and day out that's uncomfortable so um in a larger than a nutshell that's I, that's that's how i would sum up to what what helped me do what i did so well and i was very good at that stroke and i was very good at that event in particular i was a 200 backstroker that went down to the 100 and I can, right. I I wouldn't say I faked the hundred, but I, I brought it down to the one hundred. Uh, I was a, but I was a two hundred backstroker. Yeah, and that's what I always put the emphasis on. How often would you say, percentage wise, would you make a freestyle set that the rest of the guys were doing? You made it a backstroke set. Percentage wise, I don't know, but I could do that. And that's actually, yeah. that's a really interesting point because as a backstroker and you're a very good backstroker, you're able to have people that are all, you can always race somebody in practice faster than you because there's a freestyler right next to it, right next door to you. And you can do a lot of freestyle sets with backstroke. And, uh, and, and again, and I, I don't think it's unique to backstroke. It's a matter of finding this certain rhythm that's sustainable. And, and you know, a, a, the, the contrast to that is is like when you when you hear like, "Hey, let's kick harder, kick harder." And and it, and when when I think of that, it, it what I think of is you know, kicking harder is just just going to make me more tired. It's not about kicking harder. It's about using your kick with your pull making sure they line up, making sure mm -hmm. that you're you're not overusing one thing than the other, but that they're using them yeah. in harmony. Everything has to be harmonized and in balance and and left and right, top to bottom. And, and so, you know, you know that, that takes patience because sometimes that means stepping back. That means you not, may not be working as hard to find that because yeah. that's more important. But so quite frequently, I would I would do freestyle sets with backstroke. Yeah, I do remember that. Yeah, yeah. I think I think that's what you got to do. Good way to be, for us to train. Yeah, like the two hundred fly people, they just have to do so much enough fly where it becomes easy, like a freestyle set, which just have to do. And I know you you would turn over on your back quite often and just make make the hard stuff easier. I just over on your back and doing the freestyle sets with the guys backstroke right as much as we could but you know as you get older and as you swim with a really good team those freestyle sets get pretty darn fast and hard and you're not always that successful at making them you know but that's yeah. the challenge there's like that there's that challenge you know? mm -hmm. so yeah what do you think set you apart on the spin and the finish. You always kind of had a great ability to spin the arms just a little bit faster the last quarter and really nail the finish. Is that something 
you purposely practiced, you know, in practice, or do you think it just just the years of of good good consistency? I think it goes back to that point I made about being able to maintain that rhythm and that mm-hmm. cadence. So I don't know that I picked up speed. I think I just maintained it a bit longer. Yeah, and and um, and I and I was able to keep that rhythm and find that rhythm and and uh, I was good at about not fighting myself and letting myself kind of un- let letting the race unfold. Yeah, I'll leave the the distance unfold. And when it, and you know, you know, this feeling when it lines up, it feels amazing and it doesn't line up all the time when it, you know, cause a lot of times you're, you're not always having the best day, but you got to like kind of work through that. And some days very rarely, it just lines up to where it's like, it doesn't matter. You're going to do great. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, those days are, those days are the, you know, the days that so- be remembered in their own way. Real quick, 2008, not to gloss over it too fast, but you you repeat as champion in the 100 back. Um, the medley relay went great. Uh, 200 back, Ryan Lochte was on and out-touched you. He got the gold. You got the silver. Being there in Beijing, Michael doing his thing, your third Olympics, you know, some, some added pressure, some added, you know, uh, things to deal with as you get older and, you know, just trying to stay motivated and content in a third Olympics and just it's all the stuff that comes when you've been doing this a long, long time. Can you just tell us what are some personal victories that you overcame in Beijing that made that a rewarding experience for you? Very good question. Um, I think there was a bit of an added pressure uh, that is, is, is kind of, fun to reflect on really i remember i'm waking up one morning finals was in the morning of this particular olympic games um so prelims was in the night and um i remember seeing our years in my coach chris kubik that morning he was there he was there and i see chris that morning and he looks at me and he goes aaron are you all right looks at me and I'm like all tired, you know, like he looks at me, he goes, you okay? Never seen him look at me so concerning. And I'm like, yeah. oh God, do I look that bad, you know? And I just can't, how, how are you supposed to sleep with finals the next morning? At least that it was so, I, I, I had a bit more pressure on myself that I put on myself during that particular meet that um, made it more difficult for me. And I was able to kind of keep it together and overcome that. And my 100 backstroke, I was very happy with. And the relay that we did and the 200 backstroke too. And just, a t- I got a, I medaled. I got a silver medal in the 200 back. And, and then we, this relay, we got the 400 medley relay at the end of the meet. You know, we got to kind of watch Phelps kind of say like, hey, Mike, nice job. You did it. <laughs> you know that was his <laughs> chance i'm gonna move into a room where there's some light that was yeah, his fine. chance to to uh you know kind of let let the like breathe yeah and let it let some air out so to speak and and um and so that was nice to be a part of and and uh, uh but all in all, again, third Olympic Games, uh, fantastic. It was a huge learning experience. They all are. Yeah. All this. And um, only two more years after that was in my career. And I got to end, end my, excuse me, end my career at the pool I grew up in in Irvine, California. Yeah. Which I was very grateful for. And, and, um, and it was, couldn't I couldn't have ended it in a better way. So I didn't end it at Olympic Games. I ended it at the pool, the, my home pool, at the Pan Pacific Games. And the year before that, I had the best swims of my life in yep. Rome, Italy. So um, when I was in my late 20s. And so. You know, I, and I, maybe you could. I did. I'm very grateful for my career. I, yeah. Very, you know. Fun, pleasant career. 
Yeah, no, that that 10 year window from 2000 to 2010 was was incredible and beautifully poetic, perfectly poetic that you finish at Irvine. And and then the last touring story I want you to share it is the the unique uh, 51 nine at Indianapolis at the World Champs Trials. And then you go to Italy and then go the 151 nine 200 meter back, still the world record. Nobody's really gotten all that close. Even the great Ryan Murphy, he's inching closer, but still it's just uh, one of those great, great world records that's still standing. And uh, maybe you could just take us back to what those 51s, I call them the 51s, because it was the 51 nine, first guy to do that in the 100 back, and then the 151 nine, first and only guy to do that in the 200 back. Tell us about the 51s. 51s, well, the uh, the 100 back, so, um, I was mentioning that, uh, we had, I hadn't really had a, uh, I, I, I had done very well internationally for a number of years, but I hadn't really been improving in my races, my times, right? like not really. And I, and I, and I, a little bit, like a little bit here and there, but my 200 back in particular, and it was starting to frustrate me a little bit it had been like seven years since i had gone faster than like a tenth in my 200 back you know and and i was like just hovering 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 and uh and there was something that you always said i remembered it was like the the work that we put in is like putting money into the bank you know we'll you'll pull it out eventually you're going to pull it out the more work you put in the more you're going to pull out so just keep putting it in and and I was just like, okay, you know, <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, that kind of mindset, but that to the point of, you know, having it all line up that year for me on one level, on a personal level, it did, it lined up to where that summer I felt really good, physically, very good. Like I actually was reaching my potential physically coupled with the suits that had come out that year and the, mm-hmm. the year before and i wasn't wearing this full body thing but i was wearing these legs and those things did make a difference but i, it, I it, but i i could tell that it, what the main thing for me was in the way that i was actually feeling that year and i was able to take a race out and actually hold on in a way that um, i felt like good i felt rested and that wasn't anything but um, my own uh, physiology at that point. I could tell yeah. how it felt. You know the difference. So the 51 was very good. Um, I was able to take it out at a decent speed, but I was able to like build that last 50 like crazy. And um, and I saw 51.9. I was like, oh my goodness. I'm not supposed to be going 51.9 to the back or the 100 foot back. And so that was fantastic. And, uh, and there was a time that I, and I went to 153.0 at that at nationals at that moment, right. in the 200 back. So I felt better in the hundred back at nationals at world championships. I don't even make the finals in the 200 in the hundred meter backstroke at world championships. The one I had just broken world record. In. But at that, at that particular meet, I felt much better for a 200. It's like, there's two different strokes. You know, yeah. like there's like a hundred stroke and a 200 stroke. And my hundred stroke was very good for nationals. So I nailed it. And then my 200 stroke was very good for worlds. And I remember, I remember um, the, the warm up pool at that meet was um, a, a white marble pool. And yeah, I remember, I remember it. I've been there. Yeah. And, I, and it was built by Mussolini in the 1930s. This thing, yeah. like with Ro- the mosaics of Roman, gorgeous. Just yep, it's a, it's, a, and, it's a cool warm up pool. Yeah, and oh. uh, it's a quite a warm up pool, and um, and I remember swimming around, going like, I I don't think I warmed up for more than like a three hundred for finals, just thinking like, I feel good, I should stop, and I got yeah. out, and and I remember looking. And I remember sitting and watching the stands and just thinking how pretty of a day it was. And I was with Jack Roach, a friend of ours, yeah. of all of the whole sports, right? It's a, he's a friend of the sports. 
and Jack was there coaching with us. And we sat and we liked, we watched the stands for a bit. And he's like, Aaron, I think you should go to the, the ready room. And I'm like, okay, I guess we should go. <laughs> and, uh, and I just remember that particular night. It was just that one swim that lined up. 151 so it's to this day one of the best ones i had so that summer was very good for my career it allowed me to think of the following year in irvine as my last year yeah. as thinking like i felt good with that i i felt like i had maxed out enough to be happy and that i would continue my career in the water in other ways body yeah. surf other stuff I don't know. so just you know it was very uh i liked how it unfolded yeah yeah well it was a beautiful 2009 and a, and a, a wonderful way to go out in 2010 and uh, i just want to thank you for your service to the usa team and to inspiring people all over the world and just the last couple of minutes of our yeah. program i want to talk about uh the global adventures we've had together and the places you've been able to park and and uh, I just think it's fascinating you know maybe you could give us a perfect day in each of these spots now you you've uh, you lived in Austin for a while and you made the most of Austin and you mastered the schedule in Austin the best places to eat the best places to go play and then you you you've mastered life in in Costa Rica for a while Maybe you could share with us a perfect day in Costa Rica. And then now you're in Hawaii. Just You just enjoyed a beautiful sunset as we're recording. And uh, now it's getting darker. But maybe you could share with us a, a day in the life of Aaron Pearsall in Hawaii. So, so start with Austin, then Costa Rica, and then Hawaii. And I forgot Newport Beach. You've been parked in Newport Beach in Southern Cal for a, a bunch of your life as well. Right. But um, maybe... Yeah. <laughs> I'll do, I'll, I'll touch on a couple of the, um, yeah. um, okay. So Austin was Austin. The perfect morning for me would be to wake up super early, very early. I wake up early no matter where, but wake up super early and then, uh, grab my two dogs, which I had in Austin at the time. And I go out to the trails and I go running for an hour and a half and I go and explore the trails, let them off the leash and run with me. And after, after that, um, come back, sit on my deck for a little, little bit, um, drink some coffee, uh, eat at one of my nice little places in town, which should be lovely. Maybe go watch a movie at the Alamo Draft House or yeah. go downtown, listen to some music and, uh, and go to the park. If it's a nice day, meet some friends, that kind of thing. Austin is a lovely city. Yeah. Um, our friend... <laughs> Our uh, our friend, one of our friends, my old teammates, is is having a, a birthday in next month, and so he's trying to bring a bunch, uh, a few people over. And I've already, I'm already trying to plan my way back right now. But, um, a, a perfect day in Costa Rica. Um, same. Wake up super early, super duper early, like five, four, four thirty-five, and and um, have a cup of coffee. Load the load the boards up in the car with my dad and mom. Um, throw uh, boards on the car. Go down, check the surf. Go surf with my dad for a couple hours, and um, maybe even go somewhere else. But you know, find a find a great little place to surf for much of the morning. Or take a run, or take a run, swim, run, be active on the beach. Come back, um, have maybe pull out my typewriter, which I have down there, which seems silly, but it's the perfect place for it. Do some writing, um, and work around the house. Maybe do some painting or some stuff in the garden, in the yard. Go down and work on the land. Try to figure that out and. Uh, so much to do it never ends with that place so yeah. there's always something going on it's a lot of fun hawaii same wake up early go down to the beach go for a surf up here i'm on maui right now and so up here uh the volcano is this is wonderful trails and things and places to go hiking and and exploring there's waterfalls nearby 
So getting out into nature and doing that, but the water is so lovely here in the islands that um, sit on the beach, watch whales, uh, make sure you do that. There's an old adage that I love that um, I'll, never, I'll never forget it. <laughs> it says, uh, uh, gods do not deduct from man's allotted time those hours spent whale watching. Hmm. And I just basically you're immortal. Like if you just sit there and watch whales, you'll never die. <laughs> yeah. And I just, it, it's true. There's something about it where time stops. You're watching a whale and it, it spouts and you're counting the spouts out on the water. And I just love that. And you can hear, we can hear them singing underwater too. So you can go, wow. and go down and, and hear them singing. And there's a teammate of our, of, of, of mine here too, um, who swam at University of Texas and she lives here and she's a wonderful free diver. She's mm. lived uh, just up the island and awesome to watch her evolve with all that. And um, so there's there's tons of stuff on, for me in a nutshell. I like being outside. Yeah, and that's where I that's where I get my like my my soul is filled in yeah. that regard. If I can add a dog to it, even better. <laughs> and friends, even better. Um, love to read, love to write, and that kind of stuff. I love it. I love it. Well, I, I get to hear those stories a lot from you when we're traveling together. And you and I have our own I travel stories together. We've been stuck in a blizzard and trying to make a clinic in Wyoming before. And we, so much fun. We, <laughs> we, 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 pushed, blizzards together. <laughs> we pushed through that blizzard till 3 a.m. just to work with the kids. We tried our best. Yeah. But, um, yeah. yeah. Anyway, so lots of great. We've been everywhere. Uh, thank goodness. And, and it's one of the best things of it all. And and, um, and for all the viewers, you should know how much Josh, your, your MC for this podcast has done for the sport and continues to do and how grateful we all are and how grateful you should be as well, that he is in our sport. So thank you, Josh. Yeah, that means a lot. Our community. Amen. You're in our community. So thank you. Amen. Thank you. Well, I just uh, want to encourage anybody out there listening that's a decision maker at your club, you know, if you're a swim mom or a board director or a, a coach and you have the chance to to do a swim clinic with Pearsall or if you, even better, you want both of us to come to your team for a clinic, we would we would love to do that and hear Aaron's stories in person to see Aaron demonstrate the backstroke and his progressions in person is, is the thrill of a lifetime. And uh, so Aaron, I can't wait to do a clinic with you again soon. I can't wait yeah, to likewise be on a beach together soon. I know. I can't wait just to yeah be on a pool. I'd be on a pool deck with a group of kids like that again. I it's been so long, you know. But we know everyone's just kind of inching back as best they can, and I'm glad to see that. It, and I and I'm crossing my fingers for all the the, the kids and and older you know athletes gearing up for the summer and I know how hard last year was. Um, I try to put myself in the shoes, we all do, of the kids that are that are at the, at that time that are that are competing and, and being in the sport. But again, I going back to like that earlier point that we were talking about with my disqualification, you don't get to choose what we don't get to choose what our little hiccup is in this, right? It's yeah. it's just there's these interesting kind of experiences that we get to um, walk through, and it's more about the experience than it is about you know what you thought your goal might be, as it turns out. And and uh, it's it might not be easy to see at the time, but is it's it's the it's these kinds of experiences that are so um, formative for us. They're they're yeah. everything, and they make that they make the next year that much sweeter and better. And they, they let us know why it is we're doing what we're doing. Yeah. I think it's a great thought to end on. You know, a lot of people are getting ready for the Olympic trials and the Olympic Games. And you, you've got to enjoy the journey because if you stress and worry about the result, it's, it's not going to make you swim faster. It's just yeah. added pressure the you don't irony, need. The irony is it might actually make you swim slower. <laughs> yeah. You know, because it adds up. You might be stressed. You might get less sleep might not be as upbeat it's it, it, the trick is to keep a smile on your face and to be easy mm -hmm. and and let that stuff roll off your back because 
uh, that the anxiety and the stress and the tension, which can be easier said than done to alleviate, is also what can um, be detrimental. It can compound on itself. And part of this understanding of how we operate in these stressful situations is figuring out how to manage stress. Yeah, like that's what it is. Like that's what we're trying to figure out. And none of us stop being nervous. It's just figuring out how to manage it. And yeah. and you know, sometimes we're better than others at it. You know, or better than other times. So yeah. it turns out I, I got worse at it as I got older <laughs> you know, at times, <laughs> which is which is silly. And you so you got to manage that. And you're like, wait a second. So you learn. learn. Yeah. Well, I just appreciate how you were so competitive, such a gamer, yet you you kept your cool, you kept your composure, you kept perspective, and you, you fought for that balance of incredibly competitive, but enjoying the process, enjoying the journey, uh, caring about others. So competitive, but cool and caring. And that's the epitome of an ultimate VCs. That's the epitome of an ultimate swimmer, competitive but keep your cool and you care about others along the way. So thank you for being an ultimate swimmer. Thank you for being on my show. And I, I can't wait to see you around the pool soon, my friend. Me too. I want to give you a hug, Josh. It's been too long. Yeah. <laughs> no. Virtual hug. All everybody there. Yeah, seriously. Right. Well, we're, we're way overdue for a, a, a big uh, gathering, a reunion at, at one of your places, you know, in Costa Rica or Hawaii. <laughs> so we, we all joke. We're going to, we're going to meet, meet at your place someday soon. It, it's a joke that will come to fruition soon. Yes, yeah. it will. We'll love to have you. Uh, I love, love you, man. You we'll talk to you soon. Miss and love you. Okay. Thanks. Great to be on the show. I want to take a moment to tell you about my favorite swim cap, the Hammerhead swim cap. It's the safest, fastest, longest lasting, most comfortable swim cap in the world. It's one-of-a-kind patented honeycomb shock-absorbing technology will prevent concussions. And the hammerhead cap has no wrinkles to ensure top speed with the least resistance. And it's super comfortable. That's easy to get on and easy to get off. And it will never tear. This is the last cap you will ever need to buy. Safety and speed, all at hammerheadswimcaps.com. Thank you for joining us on this Ultimate Swimmer podcast. We hope you enjoyed hearing from these Olympians and life champions and how certain habits and decisions help them on their journey, and they can help you too. If there is an Ultimate Swimmer from your team that you would like to nominate that we can recognize on our show, just email me at josh at joshdavis.com. That's josh at joshdavis.com. And tell us about how your Ultimate Swimmer is making a difference in your swimming community. And that's the goal to make a difference and swim with purpose. Not only are you getting better, but you're helping those around you get better too. When you realize you were born for the water, born for greatness, and born to serve others, you are on your way to becoming an ultimate swimmer. I'm Josh Davis. Until next time, keep streamlining and keep smiling. See you around the pool soon.